Can you hear me? Perfect. Uh, my name is Gail Cummings. I am the program director for the Public Health Program, and we are so thrilled to welcome you to our fourth annual, annual Social Justice and Public Health Series. Each year, um, as many of you may know, our, our, our course focuses on a relevant public health topic. And this year, our topic is immigration, and we are so uh, excited to be bringing uh, a number of different experts from multidisciplinary fields to help us ex really examine public health Im impacts of migration, immigration, anti-immigration policies here in the U.S., and the impacts on our families, communities, and the individuals. This series serves as a required course for all of our MPH students. However, all our lectures are open to the public um, and is free and available, and we're so pleased to see so many people from our, our local um, communities here today. So thank you so much for attending. Um, this is the first of our six-part series this year, and it will run almost every Monday, so hopefully you all have a schedule in front of you and you can see the details for more information. Um, before we get started, um, I would like to invite up Anesti Vega to the stage who will, um, is not only serving as our filmmaker for the series, and we're really excited about that, but he's also generously um, uh, agreed to provide a land acknowledgement and blessing to help us honor the traditional inhabitants of the land that we are doing this event on. So thank you, Anesti. You need a mic? Aho, my name is Anesti Vega. I'm a member of the Tupi Namba tribe of Brazil. And uh, I want to keep this brief, but I wanted to just serve as a reminder that we're on indigenous land here. Uh, you guys know this as Vallejo, but that's a colonial term given to this region. It was historically known as Patwin. It's land that was run and stewarded by the Yocha Deje Wintu Nation historically. And that's important to acknowledge and recognize, especially the, given the history of California natives and the state-sponsored genocide uh, given when California first formed as a state. When California first became a state, one of the first acts that the governor made was to reimburse vigilantes for their ammunition and their time uh, for those who went around and served as murderers state sanctioned murderers to kill off indigenous people of this land. We're given very much a, a glorified and romanticized version of the gold rush, you know, and Westerners, you know, people from the East Coast coming here to the West to, in search of, you know, better future to find gold, but at what cost to the indigenous peoples here? And so as you proceed forward, uh, with the social justice work and public health work that all of you will be doing, please keep that in mind. Especially when you think about as we get closer, as we talk about immigration uh, and this topic as a social determinant of health, immigration status is one of them, as I'm sure you all know. You, when you think about an indigenous perspective on immigration, you have many indigenous tribes that were split by the colonial border between the United States and Mexico, right? You have the Kimaye region, in San Diego, whose land was split, right? We have the Pima, the Yaqui, the Tohono O'odham. You, you go all across that border, all the way through Arizona, Texas, New Mexico. You have indigenous lands that were split by the border. So the indigenous perspective on immigration is, how can we be labeled immigrants on our own historical land, right? Because if you think about it, it's not white people who are being targeted through racism, uh, in the midst of these immigration discussions, right? Not white people from Canada, not from Europe, and not even white people who are the descendants of the colonizers of Spain, from Spain and Portugal, who colonized Central and South America and Mexico, right? These are very much brown people, descendants of the Aztec and the Maya and other indigenous tribes throughout history that are being adversely affected by these immigration policies. And so when you take that indigenous perspective, you know, how can we be labeled immigrants on our own land? It kind of helps provide a different perspective and hopefully one that you take into consideration as you have this discussion more about uh, immigration policies. Thank you very much.
I'd like to now introduce Dr. Lisa Norton, who, as many of you know, is the Dean of the College of Education and Health Sciences, and she'll provide a couple of words and overview before we begin. Thank you so much. So I am so excited to be introducing the fourth um, social justice series. It's actually one of the reasons I took the job here at Toro is because I knew when we have a whole series on social justice dealing with topics that are very important to public health, education, and community, that this is a place I wanted to be and work I wanted to do. So I want to start today with a quote. Um, so I, those of you that know me, I do research on Latinx communities, and I look at um, specifically borders. Um, one of my main theorists I look at, her name is Gloria Anzaldúa. How many of you have heard of Gloria Anzaldúa before? Raise your hand. Okay. So she's a Chicana feminist that does a lot of uh, work around borders and what borders mean. And so it's a great way to open up um, this, this evening's topic. So she talks about, um, and before a scab forms, it hemorrhages. She's describing the border. The lifeblood of two worlds merging to form a third country, a border culture. Borders are set up to define the places that are safe and unsafe, to distinguish us from them. A border is a dividing line, a narrow strip along a steep edge. A borderland is a vague and undetermined place created by emotional residue of an unnatural boundary. It is the constant state of transition, is in a constant state of transition. The prohibited, prohibited and forbidden are its inhabitants. And so I want to open with a quote because borders are actually human made, right? They're not actually natural formations. And so we've created these borders um, that basically separate us sometimes from the other. And I'd like us to venture to think of a world without the other that we are all actually not divided by our borders. Um, so with that said, right now, immigration obviously is a hot topic. We have um, the elections coming up, and there's a lot of really dehumanizing language that's out there to describe those that have come across the US border. Um, separating families, uh, a lot of times, language is used that does not recognize all as, as humans. And there's a lot about sanctuary cities, which by the way, city of Vallejo is a sanctuary city. Um, and then there's our DACA, our Dreamer students, who um, basically are being threatened to actually have to return after living here their whole lives. And I do a lot of work around Dream Act and, and DACA students. So I want to invite you today to have an open mind and heart and think about as you're moving forward as public health students or nursing students or community members, that these are, these are sensitive topics, but they're actually really important because health is impacted by these communities. So the anxiety that populations in our country live under for not knowing whether they can stay here or not stay here, um, it's, it actually creates physical and emotional anxiety and stress. And I have lots of friends and family members, um, community members I know that you know, day to day break out in hives from the stress of not knowing um, where their home is or is not. They know their home is here, but they're not sure tomorrow it will be. So I want to thank so much Dr. Seth Holmes for coming out and starting. I encourage all of you to come to the reception afterwards to um, uh, actually get a signature of his book that's out. And I'm excited to actually have some of our um, farm workers that are here to talk about the story. I remember I marched with Cesar Chavez about I'm going to age myself 20 years ago um, in Napa, so I'm excited that we're, the work continues. Um, progress comes in fits and waves and in localized spaces. So for those of you who haven't heard of Gloria Enzaldúa, she's, she's now passed on to the, to the other world. I encourage you to pick up some of her books. Um, it will really, uh, in a creative, artistic way, um, broaden this topic and, and what we're addressing in the public health series. So thank you all for this time. And I welcome you to our campus. If you're new to our campus and students, keep up the good work. Um, we're excited to teach you more. So thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Norton. So I have the task for our students of introducing um, 
both our speaker today, but before we begin, I do need to introduce the course. So this is uh, a required course for our uh, entering students and an elective for students who are enrolled in Public Health 632. Uh, the course website is up. I need you all to carefully look over the syllabus to make sure that you can fulfill the requirements for the course. The um, one of the main requirements is attendance, and so there is a sign-in sheet as you came in um, at the table. Everyone is responsible for signing in if you are enrolled in the course. It's the only way you'll receive credit. If you have any questions regarding course content, um, how you'll be uh, graded for the course, you can send me an email um, via the course link or just come by the office. Any questions about the course? All right. After uh, today's session, we'll also have a reception and book signing for uh, Dr. Holmes and uh, Farragut. So I'd invite you all to come, and it will start about 5, um, I'm sorry, 7 p.m. after the end of this session. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Holmes and his panel. Um, as well, they'll be introduced at the close of his lecture by Dr. Holmes. Uh, Dr. Holmes is on the faculty in the Division of Society and Environment um, and the Joint Program in Medical Anthropology, and Medical Anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. He's a cultural and medical anthropologist um, and a physician. He's worked on social hierarchies. He's also worked in the, the areas of health inequities uh, and immigrant health. Uh, and He's also worked in areas of uh, food security, agro-food systems, uh, which culminated in the development of his book, uh, Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies, which you all will have the opportunity to purchase if you'd like, um, but also he will provide um, a very in-depth overview um, about the book and his research. And so I'd like to invite Dr. Holmes to the podium now for his lecture. So why don't you try here yeah. first? So I'm going to try with this, so then I don't need to use the other one. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah? OK. Well, if you can't hear me, will some of you in the back raise your hand, and I can try to switch to the hand mic? <laughs> OK. I got a heads, hands up. All right, so it's an honor to be here at Toro University. It, you have a beautiful place to study, and you have some exciting faculty who are doing interesting things, bringing Gloria Anzaldúa's theories together with uh, focus on health and population. Um, and it's an honor to be the first speaker in your social justice and public health series. So I'm going to give a lecture and overview from my research and my book work. And then I'll be on a panel with um, three indigenous immigrants from Mexico and a farm worker organizer from California, and we'll all be available to answer questions. I know some things from the research that I've done, but other experts on farm work are people who do farm work. Um, so the idea today with the panel is also not to have the white guy with two doctorates, be the only expert on farm work, but also to be able to ask questions of people who have taught me a lot of the things that I know and that I'm going to share with you today. So, so today I'm going to present, oh, I should also say I'm an anthropologist. And as an anthropologist, I'm trained to actually read you a paper, which when I'm in the audience, I usually find a little bit boring. And as a physician, I'm trained to give you a PowerPoint presentation, which also, honestly, when I'm in the audience, I find sort of boring. So today, I'm going to do both. Um, I'm going to talk about some of my research related to Latinx migrant health in the United States. And again, I'm happy to answer questions afterwards on things that I didn't talk about, but there'll be a panel of other people who know a lot about this as well. Part of this relates to my research for the book, Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies, which is also in Spanish. And if you do want someone to sign it afterwards, I can do that. But also the people who taught me everything I know about it could also sign it. So there are two primary questions that have animated my research that I'm going to talk about today. 
The first is, through what mechanisms do fundamental political, economic, and social structures lead to health inequities? And how can we develop some processes, some practices, some frameworks among health professionals to counteract that? The second question is, through what mechanisms are social and health inequities normalized and naturalized, both in society and in the health sciences, such that they're reproduced and not questioned or confronted? And how can we work against that process? So you might ask, why should you listen to a talk about Latinx migrant workers? And for some quick numbers, the United Nations Population Division estimates that there are 175 million transnational migrants in the world, 50% more than a decade ago. So there are a lot of things going on in the world politically, in terms of war, in terms of global warming and climate change that mean that a lot of people are moving more than before. Each year, the U.S. employs over 2 million migrant and seasonal farm workers. The National Agricultural Worker Survey indicates that 81% of farm employees are immigrants, 95% of whom are from Mexico, and over half of whom are undocumented. And it's estimated that there are a million indigenous people from the Mexican state of Oaxaca, primarily Mixtec, Zapotec, and Triqui people, largely in California. Transnational migration is particularly compelling in California, the state with the highest percent of foreign-born workers. You might also think through some of the immigration raids that have been going on, on in farms over the last couple years, especially. On a national level, migrant farm workers have very poor health statistics in comparison with other groups. Can you still hear me in the back? Okay. While the dominant understanding of immigrant health is what some researchers call the healthy immigrant effect, or the Latino paradox, in which foreign nativity is understood to confer a protective effect, if we think through different subgroups of immigrants, we have to critique and challenge this framework. To be specific, agricultural workers have an occupational fatality rate, a death rate directly from their work, over five times higher than the average worker in the U.S. In addition, agricultural workers have been shown to have increased rates of injuries, chronic pain, heart disease, cancer, stillbirth, and birth defects. Among agricultural workers, migrant and seasonal farm workers have the poorest health. They and their children have increased rates of many conditions, including HIV, TB, heat stroke, malnutrition, diabetes, insomnia, anxiety, memory problems, sterility, liver and kidney disease. And if I read all of the research, the list is too long. In addition, among farm workers, working directly in the soil has been shown to have a comparable effect to smoking on lung health. So one year of working directly in the soil does similar things to our lungs as smoking for a year. But despite this health status, migrant farm workers have very poor access to health care. Only 5% of migrant farm workers have health insurance. And although there's a federally funded migrant health program, it's estimated that this program serves only 10 to 15% of the intended population. In addition, despite the increased occupational injury rate, Farm workers are excluded from uh, co workers' compensation benefits, including health care in most states. So hopefully you see some of why you should be paying attention to this. The research project that I engaged in involved multi-sided, multi-method research related to indigenous tricky migrant farm workers from the Mexican state of Oaxaca. Some of my teachers are here today. The research began in rural Washington state and involved participant observation, as well as interviews, media analysis, chart reviews, and oral histories. Specifically, I spent about five months living in a migrant labor camp, picking strawberries alongside the other adults in the camp twice a week, accompanying migrant workers to clinics, hospitals, and social service institutions, as well as interviewing other farm employees and area residents. Next, um, I went with an extended Triki family as they migrated and spent several months in Central California, living first homeless out of our cars and using a city park bathroom. And then 19 of us moved into a three bedroom slum apartment where there was one or two people in each bedroom, one or, uh, one or two families in each bedroom and in the living room. And then I was the lucky person who had my own room, which was literally the closet and I could lie down kind of and close the door and write field notes at the end of the day. 
We looked for work, occasionally pruned vineyards, and again I accompanied migrant laborers when they went to clinics and hospitals. Next, I spent four months in the tricky home village of San Miguel. All, uh, all the names of people and places are changed. Um, San Miguel in the mountains of Oaxaca, Mexico. In the house of one of the tricky families I met in Washington state that was being constructed while family members were sending money back. I helped in house construction, harvested corn, and accompanied tricky families whenever they went to see a doctor. Um, I also engaged in a community health needs assessment with the nurses who were working in that um, town. In April of that year, I accompanied 10 young men from this village as they ventured to a border town, made contact with a coyote, a border crossing guide, and then crossed the border into Arizona on foot, were apprehended by the border patrol and put in border patrol jail. After my companions were deported back to Mexico and I was released with a fine for not going through customs, um, I interviewed border patrol officers, border activists, and civilian vigilantes in Arizona before returning to Central California and meeting up with most of my companions who were able to cross again. One of the people wasn't able to cross because of how much money it costs to pay transportation and coyotes, etc. And I've returned to each of these primary field sites several times since the completion of this year and a half full-time research. So the rest of the talk will involve the analysis of some primary findings. First, there's a subtle but intricate hierarchy in agriculture based on ethnicity and citizenship. Second, this social structure appears to produce the health disparities that I outlined at the beginning of the talk, primarily through living and working condition inequities. This counteracts a common assumption within the health sciences that it's primarily the individually chosen behavior of either the worker or the farm owner that leads to sickness and suffering. Third, there's a lack of social analysis in the practice of migrant health care that often leads to inadvertent and sometimes subtle blaming of the patient. However, this isn't the common social science critique claiming clear-cut victimization. Rather, the data show that the beliefs and behaviors of health professionals themselves are also determined largely by social structures. And I'll give some examples of um, health professionals and migrant farm workers working to change things along the way. Fourth, social and health disparities come to be seen as natural through metaphors of race and body difference. And we'll conclude with a consideration of what some people are calling structural competency or other people are calling health justice frameworks to confront discrimination and inequity related to health and health care. So the rest of the talk will take place primarily in the Skagit Valley of Washington State, nestled between Mount Baker and the San Juan Islands, roughly halfway between Seattle and Vancouver. Parts of it will also take place in Madera, California. The Tanaka Farm is the largest farm in the Skagit County, employing 500 people in the peak of the picking season, roughly June through October. The farm is famous for strawberries from a Northwest variety that are bred by the father of some of the current growers. The Northwest variety is red throughout, and it's used by companies like haagen that want to be able to say that they have strawberries, milk, and sugar, and not red food coloring number 27 or flavoring number whatever. Unlike the California variety, the Camarosa, that we're used to buying that's red on the outside and white in the middle, and the white part doesn't really taste that much like a strawberry. The Tanaka farm is vertically integrated, consisting of everything from a plant nursery to berry production and a processing plant. The Tanaka farm advertises itself as, quote, a family business spanning four generations with over 85 years experience in the small fruit industry. On a practical level, employees on the farm grow, harvest, process, and sell berries, supporting the explicit goals of the company. On another level, the structure of farm work involves a complex hierarchy. The structure of labor is both determined by the inequalities in society at large, specifically those organized around race, citizenship, and socioeconomic status, and in certain ways it reinforces those larger inequalities. The structure of farm labor includes several hundred workers in many different positions from owner to receptionist, field manager to tractor driver, and berry checker to berry picker. Anxieties, privileges, and health status differ from the top to the bottom of this labor organization. So next I'll run through this agricultural structure, briefly starting with the farm executives 
and moving through to the berry pickers before then considering what's going on in the clinic and the hospitals and public health. The third generation of Tanaka brothers makes up the majority of the executives on the farm. The others are Anglo-American professionals recruited from other businesses. The executives work seated behind desks in private offices and live in their own houses, many with panoramic views of the valley. They work incredibly long hours, usually starting before the sun comes up. They often take time off during the day to work out at the local gym or meet a friend to eat. They worry about farm survival in a bleak landscape of competition and economic globalization. The farm president, John Tanaka, explained, the challenge for us at a management level is that we've got to maintain our fair share of the market. The difference is that in South Carolina, they have federal minimum wages, which at the time was $5.75 an hour. In Washington state, I'm paying a picker $7.16, the state minimum wage, competing in the same market. That's a huge difference. It creates a challenge for a farmer. I would say the largest challenge for survival is probably offshore competition. For example, China. They could take a strawberry and bring it to San Francisco and deliver it to a restaurant cheaper than we can, and a lot cheaper if they bring it to Japan. We pay seven sixteen an hour, whereas in some countries that we're talking about, they don't pay that in a day. The executives attempt to run a family farm that can survive these pressures in order to leave something for their kids. John explains, it's different than other businesses where you grow a business and then you sell out, or you reach a certain profit level that you're comfortable with. In our business, we grow it for the next generation, which means that when I retire, you know, I can't pull dollars out of the company because it would leave the next generation with a big gap. That's what we focus on. The crop managers have private offices in a small field house several miles into the field from the farm office, though they spend a significant amount of time driving and walking and overseeing what's going on in the fields. They work similar hours to the executives, but have less choice in when they take breaks, roughly dependent on whether their bosses are around or not. That's sort of a joke, but sort of true. The administrative assistants who work seated at desks in common spaces live in relatively simple family houses near the farm. They're almost entirely white with a few US citizen Latinos. The teenage checkers weigh the berries, enforce the farm rules, including the allowed number of leaves per flat, and spend much of their time waiting. Both the administrative assistants and the teenage checkers worry primarily about the moods and reactions of their supervisors. The other workers live in one of three labor camps. The first holds 50 people and is located 100 feet from the road. Each shack in this camp has heating and insulation and the field supervisors who walk outside observing and directing the pickers live here. Some treat their workers with respect while others use outright racist epithets. Both groups are bilingual in Spanish and English, almost entirely Latino US citizens, along with one Mixteco indigenous man from the Mexican state of Oaxaca. The second camp located a few hundred feet from the road, holding roughly a hundred people is made up of similar looking units with insulation, but no heating. This is where those who pick raspberries and apples, as well as a few of the strawberry pickers live. The raspberry pickers work long hours sitting on large harvester machines and are paid per hour. The apple pickers climb ladders up and down to reach the apples and are paid per pound, making the most of all the pickers. These groups are made up almost entirely of undocumented mestizo Mexicans, along with several undocumented mixtecos and a few undocumented tricky people. The third camp, located several miles away from farm headquarters, holds 250 people. The shacks here have no heating and no insulation. And this is the, where the majority of the farm's laborers, the strawberry pickers who are paid per pound live. They're made up almost entirely of undocumented Triqui indigenous Mexicans, as well as several Mixteco indigenous Mexicans. Strawberry pickers work outside seven days a week, rain or shine, they have to bring in a minimum weight of 50 five zero pounds of de-leafed ripe berries every hour. Otherwise they're fired and kicked out of the labor camp. In order to meet this requirement, they take few or no breaks from roughly four or five in the morning until the afternoon when that particular field is completed. Many don't eat anything or drink anything before work so they don't have to take, take time out to use the porta potty. They work as fast as they can, picking and running with their buckets of berries to 
the che teenage checkers. A representative description of the struggles of a strawberry picker came from Marcelina, a 28-year-old treaky woman. It's very difficult for a person here. I came to make money like I thought here on the other side of the border there's money, but no. Sometimes the checkers steal pounds, meaning that um, the strawberry bucket would weigh in at a certain amount, but they would mark in a different amount. Sometimes rotten berries make it into your bucket. Eat that one, they say, throwing it into your face. They don't work well. This is not good. There in Oaxaca, we don't have work. There are no jobs there. Only the men work sometimes. But since there are many children in my family, the men don't make money for me and my son. That's why I wanted to come here to make money, but no. So this is a conceptual diagram of the relationship between different forms of status on the vertical axis, which include respect, health, financial security, control over your own time and control other, over other people's labor, and then different variables, including body position in labor, citizenship, language spoken, and ethnicity. This ethnicity citizenship labor hierarchy from white and Asian American US citizen to Latinx US citizen or resident, to undocumented mestizo Mexican, to undocumented indigenous Mexican, fits what we see in a lot of transnational agriculture between the US and Mexico. However, one unexpected finding related to the relative status of tricky people below Mixtecos in the farm hierarchy. When I did interviews and had conversations with different employees on the farm, Many of the white and U.S. Latinx farm employees told me that the tricky people were, quote, more simple, whereas the mestizo Mexicans stated that they were the most indi pure indigenous people. Here, what anthropologists have critiqued as uh, social Darwinism, a uh, racist understanding of certain ethnicities as being more civilized and certain ethnicities as being less civilized, seems to be relatively common within U.S. agriculture. And I, obviously this needs to be questioned and challenged. I ask you to think about when you hear friends or relatives talking about immigrants. It's true. I often felt sick to my stomach the night before picking because of all the stress about picking the minimum weight. And for the following days, I often took ibuprofen and sometimes I used the hot tub in the local gym, super aware of the inequity in access to things like hot tubs in local gyms. But because of my whiteness, because of my citizenship, because of my education, which we as anthropologists might call my social and cultural capital, the farm executives treated me as someone out of place, giving me special permission to keep my job and my shack, even though I was never able to pick the minimum weight. Which actually I should point out as a backpacking guide, etc. I worked as hard as I could possibly to pick the strawberries as fast as I could, People here and other people taught me how to pop the tops of the strawberries off with one hand because when I started, I would use both hands, which is way too slow. So you learn how to um, pick with both hands at once. Um, but in the United States, when we talk about immigration and when we make immigration laws, those laws usually differentiate between skilled workers and unskilled workers. But in my experience, the farm workers I've worked with are incredibly skilled. They know how to do things that I couldn't do as someone working as hard as I possibly could. Um, but there's something about the word skill when it comes to policy in the US that seems to show us that we don't value that much the skill that goes into feeding us and the skill that people have who provide us with our food. So the farm executives treated me as someone out of place, allowing me to continue to work. At times, they even treated me as maybe some kind of ex um, superior asking for my advice on future of farm um, labor relations and housing. The crop managers and supervisors treated me as a sort of jester, like some kind of respected entertainment. They often joked with me and laughed with me, asking rhetorical questions like, are you still glad you chose to pick? But of note, while they were walking through the fields, they would actually pick into my bucket to keep me from falling too far behind. On the other hand, pickers interacted with me with a mixture of respect and suspicion. Many wondered why there was a gabacho chacan, which is a mixture of Spanish and tricky, which became my name, the bald-headed white American, 
who was picking strawberries on the farm. Several people believed that I was a spy for the police, the border patrol, or the U.S. government. But others argued with them that I was a drug smuggler who was hiding out from the police, the border patrol, or the U.S. government. During dinner one evening in his labor camp shack, um, Francisco, who has the Nets hat on, and we'll talk with you later, complained to me about the problems that lack of resources caused in their hometown and said that they need a strong mayor in the village, a strong presidente. And I asked if he would be mayor someday. But with clear social analysis, he replied, no, you need to have education and money and ideas. You'll be presidente of San Miguel Set, and you can do a lot of good. We need water pump and paved roads. Near the end of my research, Francisco told me, it's good that you're experiencing how the poor suffer, which became in a certain way how they described what they thought I should be doing in my research. He said, right now, we and you are the same. We're poor, but later you'll be rich and live in a luxury house, a casa de lujo. And I explained that I didn't want to live in a luxury house, but rather a little simple house. And honestly, I was thinking about a craftsman in Seattle or South Berkeley where I had done undergrad and grad school. But Francisco clarified his analysis of social structures, but you'll have a bathroom on the inside, right? And now ironically, I live in a craftsman house that we just drove here from, or not ironically, I guess. The social structure based on ethnicity and citizenship not only produces the labor and housing pecking order that I described, but this whole complex maps onto the health disparities that we talked about at the beginning. The Triki people inhabit the bottom rung of the hierarchy within this agricultural system with the most stressful and physically strenuous jobs with the most exposure to weather and pesticides. They live in the shacks without insulation, without heat, in the most hidden labor camp. After the first week of picking, I asked many of the pickers about their experiences and I'll illustrate with a few examples. One young female picker stated that she could no longer feel anything in her body at all. Another said that her knees, back, and hips are, quote, always hurting. One of the young men I saw playing basketball before the harvest started told me that he and his friends could no longer play because their bodies hurt so much. Abelino, a tricky father of four who lived near me in the labor camp, explained what picking is like. You pick with both hands at once, bent over, kneeling like this, and he demonstrated kneeling all the way down. Your back hurts, you get knee pains and pain here, and he touched his hip. When it rains, you get pretty mad, but you have to keep picking. They don't give lunch breaks. You have to work every day like that to make anything. You suffer a lot in work. So, so to summarize so far, some of the most important processes leading, leading from the fundamental social structures of this ethnicity citizenship hierarchy within the United States, leading to health disparities, include both labor conditions and living conditions. During my field re research, many of my friends and family blamed the farm executives for the living and working conditions of berry pickers. They assumed that it was purely the growers fault that the pickers live in such poor conditions and that the growers could easily rectify the situation. This is an aerial view of Skagit County from 1936 to 96 leading up to my research. And it demonstrates a few things we know within agriculture in the United States and globally. One is expanding urban boundaries. For example, while I was doing research, a policy shifted in the county such that Walmart and Costco bought up large tracts of land that had been farms. And then you can see hints that smaller family farms are slowly going bankrupt or being consolidated into larger and larger and more corporate farms. The hierarchy on the farm is not entirely chosen by the farm owners or uh, managers. Rather, the inequalities are driven by large structural forces as well as the anxieties they produce. Stark market competition and a precarious future of the farm within our current system of increasingly corporate agriculture produce anxiety among growers about the possibility of the farm going bankrupt, which isn't to say that they don't have any responsibility in how they treat farm workers or whether they pay attention to who gets which jobs. But in a certain sense, the fundamental causes of the sickness and injury of farm workers are political, economic, and social structures 
that we're all complicit with and we need to think about how we can change them. So now that we've considered the hierarchy on the farm and some of the ways in which these social inequalities determine health disparities, I'd like to move on to talk a little bit more about health and healthcare. First, I'll go through some information about the migrant clinics in the US in general before moving on to the illness experiences of two specific migrant laborers and their interactions with health professionals. Most clinics serving migrant farm workers have unreliable sources of funding and many lack state-of-the-art medicines and technology. Physicians and nurses in these fields perform many duties for which they're not trained, from requesting free medicines for their patients to filling out social service paperwork. Dr. McCaffrey, a young physician in the Skagit Valley, told me, most migrants don't have any health insurance, so that's even harder, because you figure out how to start them on a medication, and you know they're just going to be off it again wherever they go next. In addition, many of the clinicians often felt hopeless as they watched the health of their migrant patients systematically decline. Dr. Samuelson, another physician in the migrant clinic explained, I see an awful lot of people just wearing out 40 something or late 30s or early 50s. They're just worn out. They've been used and abused and worked physically harder than anybody should be expected to work for that number of years. They come out with this nagging back pain you work it up and it's not getting better and you don't think they're lying about it. It gets to the point where you just have to give them an MRI scan and their back is toast. In their early 40s, they have the arthritis of a 70 year old and they're not getting better. They're told, sorry, go back to what you're doing and they're stuck. They're screwed in a word and it's tragic, unquote. Continuity of care is also very difficult due to the fact that most migrant workers move to different towns every few months. The migratory nature of their lives means that the medical records are patchy. Each clinic has records for each patient that cover only the seasons in which they lived in that area. But actually most of the clinics have several different charts for each patient for when they lived in that area. Partial, some of them written by the name on their driver's license, some of them written by the name that the person transcribes incorrectly, sometimes alphabetized by the maternal last name, sometimes alphabetized by the paternal last name. So a lot of issues in trying to figure out what should already be known about a given person. Language differences complicate the field of migrant health during the practice itself. Many clinicians are bilingual in English and Spanish, but some need a translator for Spanish speaking patients and especially with indigenous language speaking patients. Very few migrant clinics offer services in languages other than Spanish and English. The nurse practitioner midwife explained to me one day, there are a lot of staff who don't want to be bothered getting a trained interpreter. They grab me and say, oh, could you be an interpreter? This person has a right to get a real interpreter and not a five minute discussion with me when I'm running from patient to patient. It's just reluctance. It's just that one more step. It's just racism. It's just being overworked because our system is a total train wreck right now. Are you sure you want to go into the health professions? He asked me, unquote. I'm not asking you. <laughs> I think it's very important. At the same time that most health professionals in the field feel overworked and powerless to change the structural forces causing health problems for their patients, they also felt this strong commitment to work with this population. Many of them explained this feeling that Latin American migrant farm workers deserved top quality health care, then most described feeling a sense of personal calling to care for this population. So now I'll move into describing and analyzing two representative illness and treatment experiences of tricky migrant farm workers. A person I'll call Abelino, a tricky father of four who lived near me in the labor camp experienced acute pain in his right knee when he pivoted from one row to the other while picking strawberries. After continuing his work in vain hopes that the pain would go away, he told his field supervisor about the incident. The boss said simply, okay, and drove away. Unsure of what to do, Abelino kept picking in great pain. Two days later, work was abruptly canceled and Abelino and I went into an urgent care clinic. Abelino ended up seeing four doctors and a physical therapist usually without a translator in Spanish and never in Triqui. 
In the intervening months, he limped around the camp taking care of his kids while his wife took his place working in the fields. The urgent care doctor explained that Abelino should not work. He should rest and let his knee recover. The occupational health doctor we saw the following week said Abelino could work, provided he didn't bend, walk, or stand. So Abelino went to the farm office to ask for lighter work of this sort, and the bilingual receptionist told him in a frustrated tone, no porque no, no because no, and wouldn't let him talk with anyone else. After a few weeks, the occupational health doctor passed Abelino's care to a busy rehabilitation medicine physician who told Abelino and me that he must work hard picking strawberries in order to make his knee better. She asked me to translate that he'd been picking incorrectly and hurt his knee because he didn't know how to bend over correctly. But notably in her rush, she had never asked Abelino any details about his work, including how he bent over. Years later, Abelino still tells me that he has knee pain and that the doctors don't know anything. Los médicos no saben nada. Which, as someone studying to become a doctor at the time, was a little depressing. Presencio, another tricky man living near my labor camp shack, approached me after picking one day and asked if I had any medicines for headaches. He explained that every time a supervisor calls him names on the job, makes fun of him, or reprimands him unfairly, he gets an excruciating headache in the center of his head. He told me that the headaches made him prone to anger with his wife and children. He told me that he did not ever want to become violent with his family and wanted help for his headache before that could ever happen. He'd seen a few physicians about it in Mexico and the U.S., as well as a tricky healer, but nothing had helped long term. The only thing that made his headache go away was drinking 20 to 24 beers. Then he would wake up without a headache. And he explained that he had to use this remedy a few times in an average week. I suggested he go into the migrant clinic to see if they could try something new for his problem. I imagined they might start migraine medications and do diagnostic tests, try treatments for other kinds of headaches. A week later, he told me that he'd seen one of the doctors in the clinic, but that, quote, she didn't know anything, unquote. Later, I interviewed this physician about the interaction. He was trained in one of the top-ranked medical schools in the U.S. and chose to work at this clinic because she wanted to ameliorate the suffering of underserved populations. She was smart, idealistic, caring, and hardworking in the midst of a busy, understaffed, and underfunded clinic. And looking at her notes in his medical chart, she explained, He thinks that he's the victim and thinks that the alcohol or the headache makes him beat his wife, but really he's the perpetrator and everyone else is the victim. Until he owns his problem, he can't really change. Nothing really works. None of these migraine medicines or anything, but put people in jail because then they see a show of force. That's the only thing that works because then they have to own their problem as theirs and they start to change. He came to see me once and I told him to come back two weeks later after not drinking, but he didn't come back two weeks later. Instead, he came back a month later. It looks like he told the doc he saw that time something about when people at work tell him what to do, it makes him mad, and that's what gives him a headache. He needs to learn how to deal with authority. We referred him to therapy. Do you know if he's going to therapy? So I think I should point out that um, Crescencio and his family, including his wife, together and separately, all explained that he became irritable when he was having a headache, but he had never been violent with anyone in the family. Um, and so the doctor's assumption that he had been beating his wife are called into question by the family, not to say that that never happens with anyone, but to say that when you're listening, it's probably more likely that you might um, pay attention to what the doctor said as an expert and assume that that's what happened as opposed to what he and his family said that I mentioned before I quoted her. Um, a complicated situation, but I think important to try to sort through. Despite this physician's impressive idealism and good intentions, her busy, difficult job and the lenses she was given in her education didn't allow her to see the social context of the problems of her patients. 
So to summarize what we've talked about so far, structural inequities such as living and working conditions that are organized around ethnicity and citizenship determine the hierarchy of health in U.S. agriculture. Due to their location, lower in a pecking order, undocumented tricky migrant workers endure more than their fair share of injury and sickness. Yet by and large, the clinicians in the field of migrant health don't see this social context. In this case, socioeconomic, political, and symbolic structures impinge not only on migrant workers and their health, but also on the health professionals who are doing their best to serve them. So aspects of this work are consistent with, but offer a contemporary critique to strands of work from Michel Foucault. He wrote a book called The Birth of the Clinic in which he describes a theory that he calls the clinical gaze. He explains that there was a change in clinical medicine around the time of cadaveric dissection or what we would think of as anatomy lab. Whereas physicians and health professionals used to focus on the words of each person, the symptoms that the patient expressed they instead began to focus on the diseased organs, treating the patient more as a series of objects that make up a body. In Foucault's description, the primary question changed from, quote, what is wrong to, quote, where does it hurt? As would be expected within this paradigm, the rehabilitation physician and the migrant health doctor described earlier saw the tricky bodies in their offices, yet weren't able to engage the human and social context that lead, led to their injuries. Yet since the time of Foucault, the paradigm of biopsychosocial health has been taken up in public health, medicine, nursing. Beyond the acontextual gaze that Foucault theorized, physicians, public health professionals, nurses, and other health professionals in North America today are also taught to see behavioral factors in health, such as exercise, diet, and substance use. Behavioral health education has been added as part of what we might praise as a move to broaden our understanding of health and health education. However, without being trained to consider the social structures that shape the suffering of their patients, health professionals are equipped to see primarily biological and behavioral determinants of sickness. Thus, the most well-meaning health professionals in a certain way are limited to blaming the sickness on the patient. For example, the assumed incorrect bend while picking or the supposed trouble with authority. In certain ways, ironically, the progressive move to include behavioral health education um, in, uh, in health professional education without an inclusion of the ways in which social structures influence health and behavior, what some people are calling structural competency or health justice, may be exactly that which limits health professionals to blaming individuals and communities for their health problems. So we've talked through the first few primary findings that I outlined at the beginning of the talk. And now I'd like to ask, how is it that stark social inequities and their correlated health disparities largely go unchallenged and unquestioned? How have these social and health inequities come to be understood in society as though they're normal or natural? And in broader, broader terms, how do societies come to treat certain groups of people as though they should be written off or understood to deserve their social standing and health, either poor social standing and health or positive social standing and health. Aspects of this work are reminiscent of Pierre Bourdieu's theory of symbolic violence, and I'll describe it briefly. This theory explains that we perceive the social world through what he calls cognitive schema, lenses, categories. These cognitive schema are produced by and reflect the social structures to which we've become accustomed. Thus, we often misrecognize the social order as natural because the inequities we're perceiving match the lenses through, we're through which we're perceiving it. The inequalities comprising the social world thus become invisible to us, taken for granted or normal. When I asked a Mestiza Mexican social worker why tricky people had only berry picking jobs, she explained, A los Oaxaqueños les gustan trabajar agachados. Le dijo, dijo una trabajadora social. Oaxacans like to work bent over. Whereas she told me Mestizo Mexicans, whom she called simply Mexicanos, get too many pains if they work in the fields. 
Later, I asked the farm's apple crop manager why I hadn't seen any tricky people harvesting apples, which is the field job with the highest pay. And he explained, Oaxacans are too short to reach the apples. They're too slow. They have to use ladders a lot more than some of the other guys. And besides, they don't like ladders anyway. He continued that Oaxacans are perfect for picking berries, quote, because they're lower to the ground, unquote, which is the exact same thing that a California senator said in a hearing about migrant labor a couple decades ago. These representative statements show a perception of bodily difference along racial lines that serve as the lenses through which symbolic violence occurs. In this way, each category of body is understood to deserve its relative social position. Because of the things that are understood to be their natural characteristics, indigenous Mexican bodies are perceived as though they belong picking berries as opposed to other jobs. <clears throat> On the other hand, mestizo Mexicans and white Americans are understood to have bodies that don't fit well in the picker category and belong doing other work. <clears throat> At the same time that symbolic violence involves the normalization of the social and health position of other groups, this theory also involves a subtle sense of internalization. One doesn't perceive only others, but also oneself as belonging in ordained social locations. I might, with my Berkeley students, I often challenge them when they're walking along Telegraph Avenue to pay attention to the first thought that comes to their mind when someone asks them for money. If that might relate to movies or literature that they've seen or read that teaches them that they deserve what they have because they've worked so hard and the other person doesn't deserve it because they haven't worked hard, etc. The ways in which we start to perceive that we belong where we are. During my second day picking strawberries, a tractor with large metal extensions spraying something in the air drove through the fields while we picked. I asked a supervisor what it was. Do you really want to know? You sure you want the truth? And I answered yes. Dangerous insecticides, he said, shaking his head at me. The supervisor went on to explain that the, these white patches on the strawberry leaves are largely due to pesticide residue. I later noticed danger signs posted in English only on several large canisters that were surrounding one of the hand washing and outhouse stations at the entrance to the field. Strawberry pickers worked every day without gloves as the visible pesticide res as the pesticide residues dissolved into the mixture of strawberry juice that would stain our hands maroon for the rest of the day. If they did wash their hands, they went into the danger pesticide storage area in order to do it. The same week as the spraying described above, I received a video I'd ordered from the United Farm Workers about the health risks of pesticides, and several of the tricky pick pickers watched it with me. <clears throat> After watching the movie, I asked them what they thought, and one of them told me matter-of-factly, Pesticides affect only white Americans, gabachos, because your bodies are delicate and weak. And in a certain way, I proved that both seasons that I picked because I could never pick the minimum weight. And then I went to hot tubs and took ibuprofen. Another confirmed, we tricky are strong and hold out, and the verb is aguantamos. <clears throat> and the others nodded. In this way, perhaps... A sense of ethnic pride that might be necessary in the midst of a painful history of discrimination in Mexico and the U.S. and land dispossession in Mexico may at the same time, in a certain sense, justify the labor hierarchy or one person's position within it. In effect, conceptions of honor at strong, tough bodies or being told that someone has stronger, tougher bodies or shorter bodies, etc., might um, make these hierarchies of labor position less visible. So to return to the two questions that we began with, how do social structures lead to health disparities and why do we as a society and especially as health professionals largely not seem to care? We've seen that there's this ethnicity citizenship hierarchy on the farm. There are many other hierarchies we could go through that are also super important related to gender, related to sexuality, etc. Next, the data suggests that this social structure determines health behaviors and health disparities, largely through working and living conditions. But perhaps most interesting and important and angering are the ways in which these inequalities come to be understood as normal and natural, both in society and in healthcare. 
we've seen that the social structures impinge not just on migrant farm workers, but also on health professionals, such that they tend not to see the social determination of health. Rather, they often inadvertently and subtly, in well-meaning ways, blame their patients for their sickness through narrow lenses focused on biology or behavior. More broadly, we've seen that these social and health disparities are understood to be natural due to perceptions of ethnic body difference. These processes of normalization and naturalization are critical to understand because they serve to justify social structures and health disparities. This justification then serves to foster their reproduction and persistence. If we as a healthcare community are to work effectively toward improving the health of all, <clears throat> including some of the most structurally vulnerable who come from other parts of the globe, some, many of whom provide us with the fruits and vegetables that we eat and we teach communities to eat in order to be healthy. We have to engage in work to uncover linkages among political, economic, and social structures, community level factors, individual behavior, resilience, collective resistance, and health. In addition, I would argue that we have to develop something like structural competency and awareness of these structures and how we respond to them, such that we're able to perceive and respond to the negative health effects of social, economic, and political inequities. This kind of structurally competent work has to take place both in individual encounters, in community collaboration, and in work outside our health professions in advocacy with what we might call structural humility working alongside and following the lead of the communities we work with. So this research suggests many levels of potential inter intervention, from changes in the ways clinics and healthcare systems work, to changes in the way medical and public health education functions, beyond to issues of mass media portrayals, public policy, and globalization. So this project, in conclusion, of denaturalizing social and health inequities should inform pragmatic activist and policy efforts at all the levels of the micro to macro continuum, from including pickers in pharma English classes to including the social determination of health in health professional education, from buying the products of farms that treat workers fairly to the lobbying of politicians to change unrealistic and violent immigration policies. And finally, to activist and policy work for a more equitable global market, such that people might be free to, but would not be forced to, leave their homes to migrate in the first place. <laughs>